This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, we'd like to welcome you back to That's Pediatrics. I'm Carolyn Coyne. I'm a basic scientist in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. And I'm Brian Martin. I'm the Vice President for Medical Affairs here at Children's. And we would like to uh, welcome Mia Manol. Dr. Manol is uh, the Director of Basic and Translational Research in the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine. Uh, she is also the Associate Director of the Safer Center for Resuscitation Research and Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Uh, we welcome her here to talk about some of her research uh, involving vascular pathways in cerebral vascular dysregulation. And she, it's of note that she's made significant contributions in teaching and mentoring em pediatric emergency medicine fellows, undergraduates, and postdoctoral and medical students, as well as our residents and other critical care fellows here at Children's. Uh, welcome, Dr. Manol. Thank you. Thanks Happy for joining to be us. Here. So tell us a little bit, you know, one of the things I'm always fascinated about is people's sort of backstory, you know, what brought them to the disciplines they've chosen, their area of research. And so, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a clinician, but I think about all the fields that one could choose, and, and I certainly don't have the um, brain power perhaps to do or, or reaction time to, to do ER medicine. So tell us a little bit about sort of how you chose that as your career path and, and sort of when that, when that became um, something you were interested in doing. Sure. So I um, went to medical school knowing that I was going to be an ophthalmologist and uh, just because I was inspired by my um, ophthalmology physician as a child. Um, and uh, quickly I realized that pediatrics was, uh, was what I loved to do. Uh, I was uh, in medical school in Romania for six years and um, I loved uh, working with children. I loved the um, impact that I can have on a child, the quick recovery uh, that children make, and uh, that determined me to go into pediatrics. Um, in Romania, emergency medicine was not a specialty at that time. So when I came to the United States and I did my, uh, I started doing my residency, my first rotation was in pediatric emergency medicine. And at that time, I realized that that's the specialty I was going to pursue, the subspecialty I was going to pursue. And what was it that sort of drew you to that? Oh, it was um, a combination of um, intriguing diagnosis, the fact that I was the one making those diagnoses and putting the pieces of the puzzle together right there at the bedside. Um, it was the diversity of patients, the diversity of patients' ages, conditions that I was seeing, uh, the combination of um, procedures, um, skills that I was I was using, um, my uh, using the creativity in uh, you know in every in ev every day and in every patient interaction, um, and also the fact that I was always drawn to um, underserved populations. I was always drawn to doing a little bit of mission work, and I felt like in the emergency department I would see underserved. Uh, uh, children, children who don't necessarily have a regular phys pediatrician, and uh, and I can make a big impact. And to this day, this is true. And so, when did you come to uh, the Children's Hospital? Um, so I came to Pittsburgh about uh, as a second year re pediatric resident, and the Children's Hospital. I did first time a rotation as a third year pediatric resident, and then um, I did my fellowship here. Okay. So at what point in your training journey did you start to think about your sort of re the research, uh, from a research point of view, what you wanted to do as far as the research aspects of your career? That is uh, something that I love to talk about, and I talk about um, often to my fellows and pediatric uh, residents. Uh, it was serendipity that got me into research, and I love this uh, uh, I love the serendipitous pathway. So as a um, pediatric emergency medicine fellow, we needed to do one research project. And uh, a wonderful mentor from my division, Robert Hickey, was doing animal research. Well, I had heard that there, that there is this Safer Center for Resuscitation Research. 
and there are brilliant researchers over there. And having never done basic research, I said, let me give it a try. This is, you know, this is this sounds interesting. The first project that I did was a simple project of resuscitating um, newborn rats from cardiac arrest. Um, well, actually, rats of two different ages, newborns and uh, adolescent age rats. And we were doing um, a study looking at their uh, cardiac contractility. When do the heart stops in newborns versus uh, older rats? And um, we pretty much knew the answer to this, but we wanted to prove that newborn hearts are more resistant to asphyxia. And in this, um, in, in this study, we saw that gasping was autoresuscitative. And we were amongst the first to, uh, to demonstrate in an animal model that gasping auto-resuscitate the heart. And um, this, you know, this uh, gasping phenomenon is, uh, is auto-resuscitated, is um, uh, beneficial. Um, I presented at a national meeting, and then at that point, I realized that uh, um, the research path is something that I really want to combine in my, uh, in my, with clinical work, mainly because uh, um, it gives me a, a really nice space to use my creativity. It gave me a nice place to bring um, any questions I had in the, um, in the clinical practice to Benchside. And how difficult was that? So you started doing basic research as a resident. You're obviously an attending now. How difficult was it and is it to sort of just manage the, the time, um, kind of navigating time requirements between sort of your clinical work as well as your basic science work? You know, I ask that because I'm a, I'm a basic scientist and I often feel like I don't have as many hours in the day and I don't do anything but my research. So I'm wondering how difficult that is and, and certainly being in emergency medicine, if that presents sort of a unique kind of time constraint um, in terms of the ability to do basic science? Yes, um, I was very fortunate that I, you know, I, I have been at this institution. Um, from the get-go, so I, I was a fellow when I first started uh, doing basic, basic research. And um, when I expressed my, my interest to continue doing research, my mentors um, uh, directed me towards uh, uh, the Sefer Center for Resuscitation Research, where um, I was fortunate enough to um, compete for a training award, which gave me ample protected time. Mm -hmm. It gave me pretty much 75% uh, protected oh, wow. time for research um, where, while I was doing 25% clinical work. And from that point on, with the mentorship of uh, uh, giants like Dr. Bob Clark and Dr. Uh, Pat Kohanek, um, uh, my career started really taking off. Um, uh, we so I um, I uh, competed for a, a career mentor mentor development award, a K weight, which continued give, to give me seventy five percent protected oh, time, and then during my last year of the K weight, uh, I was fortunate enough to secure R one funding. Wonderful. So uh, it's been um, it's been good, and it's been good because of the institution and because of uh, excellent mentorship. So tell us a little bit about how you segued into vascular pathology. So you started off, a, you know, with an animal model uh, for um, over at the Saffir Center. Tell us how, what piqued your interest with uh, with vascular pathology and cerebral vascular dysregulation. So when we started the T thirty two award, I met with Bob Clark, and um, he was looking into. Uh, different vascular pathways, uh, and gave me a couple of projects that I could, you know, I could delve into. One of them was a collaboration with um, Carnegie Mellon University's researchers uh, looking at uh, cerebral blood flow after cardiac arrest, and for that, a new model needed to be developed, a model where we would take these 30-gram rats and we would take them uh, in, into the bore of a huge MRI machine, which was an, uh, an animal MRI, um, we needed to um, develop this model so that um, the red can be inside the machine, whereas our, ventil our ventilator needed to be 10 to 12 feet away. We needed to infuse medications through tiny, very tiny lines into these little reds. So it was a model that needed to be developed, and it was something that I was very interested in, in doing uh, for my initial year of, uh, of research. 
And um, I had a wonderful time. We had wonderful uh, results. Um, we des we uh, described for the first time that um, um, cerebral blood flow is reduced after cardiac arrest um, in uh, pediatric rats. Uh, we described this in a non-invasive way. And uh, from that point on, I, I started looking mechanistically at, uh, at this pathway. Was it was that with magnetic resonance angiogram? But for, as somebody yeah. who's not familiar with this type of research, is, was that um, the mechanism so by which you were able to, to measure this? So it uh, it is a, a novel technique that, uh, developed at uh, Carnegie Mellon University called arterial spin labeling MRI. Okay. It is a non-invasive te technique where the protons at the level of in, protons in the blood at the level of the neck are um, inverted using um, a radio frequency and. Uh, the signal is uh, is uh, picked up at the level of the brain, um, and this allows a um, so because there is no contrast agent, the the contrast agent is endogenous. Yes. Um, the this allows serial measurements of uh, cerebral blood flow. And how much do these pathways differ? So you mentioned before the need to sort of look in, and the differences that you found in neonatal rats versus adult rats. And so how, how different are these pathways and, and processes between sort of a more pediatric population, in this case your, your neonatal rat model, versus an older pediatric or an adult kind of population? Well, that's excellent. And this is a question that we, uh, we answered about three or four years after we uh, developed the model in rats. We looked uh, serially and regionally at the perfusion in adult animals after cardiac mm -hmm. arrest, and the perfusions are different. Um, there is um, a, a tour, so in, initially, right after resuscitation, the in pediatric rats, there is a regional um, um, hyperemia, so the blood flow increases in, 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 in certain regions. Uh, the cortex is, is, uh, remains always with low blood flow in pediatric rat aged rats, whereas adult rats have a generalized hyperperfusion initially. Um, very intriguing. We're still trying to determine the mechanisms um, of this. We're trying to determine whether, whether this increase um, blood flow immediately after resuscitation is deleterious versus um, because of the burst of reactive oxygen species um, versus it's just an autoregulation that is lost um, uh, at that time point. Um, later on, so in, you know, uh, in the first hour to two hours to days after uh, cardiac arrest, the blood flow is decreased in, um, uh, 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 in the cortex, uh, cortex especially in pediatric age rats, whereas in adult rats, um, these regions might uh, might remain hyperperfused. So there is a there is a, a regional difference and uh, and the time difference between uh, between age. And how much does your you know one of the things that I always again because I'm a basic scientist that that I found really intriguing about clinical scientists is you know how much your clinical work impacts your research and vice versa. Just even in terms of the questions you ask, perhaps even the the, the you know methods that you use to answer those questions. I bring many uh, many questions from the from the clinic back to the laboratory. Just recently, so we've, uh, we've um, we determined that there is a hypoperfusion in the cortex. So the cortex is hypoperfused, whereas and uh, whereas neuronal activity um, remains uh, um, preserved after cardiac arrest, which gives rise to this. Um, blood flow metabolism mismatch, uh, which gives rise to cortical hypoxia. So the cortex has low oxygenation after cardiac arrest. Um, and we know this from the, from the uh, pediatric asphyxial cardiac arrest model. Um, whereas in the clinic, we cannot uh, monitor brain oxygenation uh, non-invasively in, uh, uh, in, uh, in these patients. Um, so we... I recently um, partnered with two uh, scientists, one clinical scientist and one basic scientist, to develop um, a device called that we call Flow2 NeuroCap, a non-invasive device that uh, will measure simultaneously neuronal activity and um, uh, brain oxygenation, and will give a value that clinicians will will be able to use. Um, we were fortunate enough to uh, to received some funding from the Innovation Institute, and uh, we're almost ready to, um, so our prototype is, uh, is constructing, and, and, and we're ready to roll this out in uh, volunteers.
And so this is, is sort of the true translational from your basic science and the rat model, and then actually making a device based upon those findings that you could then implement in the clinic, you know, if a, if a child comes into the emergency room and displays this. That's, that's exciting. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really neat. Mm-hmm. Tell me, are there other areas in medicine where you see sort of cross-pollination of the cerebral blood flow work? I'm, I'm thinking, um, you know, what, what came to mind when you were speaking there were other cerebrovascular uh, situations, maybe like migraine or, um, or other areas. Do you have, have you had any other researchers reach out to you as a result of your research in the models which you've developed, which might be able to inform, um, inform other um, other areas in clinical medicine where you may have a, a, a neural and, and cerebral perfusion mismatch like what you described? Certainly, certainly. Um, migraine is, uh, you know, is, is, is a very good uh, condition to, uh, to try to that, that decipher with, um, with our tools. Um, we've done some work in uh, traumatic brain injury, um, trying to uh, assess the uh, neurometabolic coupling and uh, uh, cerebral blood flow in a traumatic brain injury. Other conditions are um, focal ischemia. I, in terms of collaborations with others, uh, um, we, we have not collaborated in, a, you know, in, a, in other conditions, um, mainly because there are, there, you know, the area that we're covering is so vast in cardiac arrest that um, there's enough work there exactly, for you. Exactly. Understood. Well, that's understood. good for you. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, what do you see, kind of, I guess, on thinking about the future? You know, where do you see your research going? What are the biggest, kind of, most exciting, either questions or avenues that that you see yourself going after, and sort of the the next few years, or even you know, the next ten years? Yes. So. Um, I, I would uh, so I would like to uh, to decipher the mechanism of this hypoperfusion and uh, hyperemia, a multimodality um, monitoring after cardiac arrest in in the clinic, mm-hmm. multimodality therapeutic uh, intervention combining uh, vasodilation, um, prevention of vasoconstriction in the brain, plus. Um, preventing what we call the no reflow phenomenon uh, in the brain after cardiac arrest. Um, and what is that? I'm not familiar with that, what that is. Um, this is a, you know, it's a fascinating uh, finding um, that we were able to um, describe using in vivo uh, two-photon microscopy, which is uh, this uh, technique that where uh, you create a small window uh, in the brain and uh, with a microscope, um, and we with using a... Um, a fluorescent mar- marker, you're able to see a depth of about one millimeter in the cortex, um, and uh, we can uh, look at uh, cerebral uh, microvessels uh, mm-hmm. in the cortex. Um, and using this technique, we um, observed that some capillaries have normal flow, whereas other capillaries have um, a, a blockage of flow. And uh, this this phenomenon is called a uh, no reflow phenomenon after cardiac mm-hmm. al- arrest. So um, we are targeting right now. So, uh, uh, besides uh, besides this, we have vasoconstriction um, of the of the bigger arterioles. So uh, we are targeting targeting right now not only the vasoconstriction but also this no reflow phenomenon. Hmm. So segue over really quickly to medical education. You've been lauded here as a as a leader in medical education, and have had uh, have had um, it's well documented that uh, that trainees really enjoy working with you. How do you find the um, conversation goes with some of your trainees in regards to their ability to see the pathway that you've taken? And do you have have you had any mentees? It's not like you've had a great mentor relationship that you're well elucidated, uh, but have you have you identified any mentees or others that are interested in, in coming along with you on your journey? Oh, this is uh, this is it, it's wonderful. I, I have wonderful news in this regard for uh, because uh, you know emergency medicine is such a clinical specialty that for seven years I've tried to enroll somebody uh, from you know from our division to to come along with me in the, in the clinician scientist journey. Um, and this year we have one fellow who um, is is ready to enroll. Um, until now, I have mentored uh, mainly pediatric intensive care, the care unit physician, uh, um, clinician scientists, um, neonatal intensive care unit um, clinician scientists, and many undergrad uh, students. But this year we have uh, we have one of our own. Great. 
Well, that is great news. Mm -hmm. Great news. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank well, you. We greatly enjoyed speaking with you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.